Welcome to our first panel. It's titled The Commercial Function of IP. And I once again, want to thank Professor Merges for his uh, very insightful talk. I think it really is a nice lead in to some of the things that we're going to be discussing this morning on this panel. Uh, so we've got a slight lineup change. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Graham is unable to join us today, um, but we are very happy to have a good friend of CPIP uh, filling, him, filling in for him, whom I will introduce in a moment along with the rest of our panelists. So I, I spoke a little bit about this panel in my earlier remarks, but the, the idea behind this discussion is to explore what we mean when we talk about intellectual property's role in the commercialization of both creative works and, and innovative products. Um, you know, in the age of the internet and, and ever increasing connectivity, there's, there's a belief or, uh, by, held by some that you know, traditional channels of commercialization are no longer necessary, um, that IP rights uh, really only benefit entrenched industry players who are looking to profit on the, off the work of another. Um, but I think what those promoting this narrative either discount or, or ignore is you know, the investments and the partnerships that go into uh, getting these works of art and game-changing technologies to consumers and, and helping drive the economy. So we'd like to better understand how IP rights in, enhance a work's value and the value chain behind getting that work to the market, um, you know, which in the words of, of my colleague Sean O'Connor are, quote, the steps required to take creative inspiration from a good idea to a finished product available in the market. <clears throat> and related to this, we're going to be hearing about how creative and inventive inspiration are in and of themselves entrepreneurial acts with intellectual property rights providing the vehicle then for commercialization. We're also going to be hear about, hearing about how IP can improve the transfer of federally funded uh, technologies from lab to market and, and deliver these products and services to help drive the nation's economy forward. And then finally, we're gonna hear about uh, how sensible copyright and patent policy supports commercialization in some specific creative and in innovation industries. So joining me uh, this morning to talk about these issues are a distinguished, distinguished group of panelists. I'm not gonna go through their entire extended bios and accomplishments, but, um, but trust me, they're the real deal. Uh, <laughs> So to my immediate right, we have joining us from University of Oregon School of Law, Professor Eric Priest. Uh, to his right, uh, joining us is Paul Zelensky, who is Director of Technology Part the, Te the Technology Partnerships Office at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And we have George York joining us from the Recording Industry Association of America, where he's Senior VP International Policy. And finally, Filling in somewhat last minute, we have Rob Stern, who's the founding director of Stern, Kessler, Goldstein, and Fox. So a special thanks uh, to Rob for, for joining us this morning on a relatively late notice. <clears throat> so our panelists are gonna get us started here with some opening remarks and presentations, and then we'll move into a, a discussion amongst the panelists, and then uh, hopefully have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, but if I could ask uh, Professor Priest to uh, get us going here. Sure, thanks. <clears throat> All right, well, many thanks to Kevin and to CPIP, of course, for, uh, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure um, to be involved in these, um, some of the best conferences that, that I get to go to. Um, so I guess my role is to kick us off, um, uh, maybe uh, taking Professor Murgis's cue, and uh, uh, you know, we'll start maybe from the ivory tower view, and then um, the panel's gonna be looking down at, um, at uh, uh, the uh, the way things that uh, the way IP is commercialized in the real world, um, the focus of my talk is actually uh, what I think is to make a fairly obvious observation. Um, but after Professor Murgis's um, uh, keynote, I think uh, you'll see that in uh, the uh, academia. Uh, field, it's not um, it's not necessarily uh, always viewed that way uh, as uh, as something entirely obvious. And that observation is that authors of copyrighted works. So I'm going to be speaking just from the copyright side. We've got um, I think patent covered uh, elsewhere, but authors of copyrighted works are entrepreneurs. 
Um, and uh, I don't mean it in the sense that authors uh, start their own businesses or Kickstarter campaigns. Some certainly do that, right? And they, and they become very entrepreneurial. But what I mean is that the act of entrepreneurship, uh, sorry, the act of authorship itself is an entrepreneurial, uh, is fundamentally entrepreneurial. And so, and when I speak of authors, I use it in the broad copyright sense. I don't just mean people who write novels, and I mean um, any, any creator of copyrighted works. Um, so I'll explain momentarily why I think authors are entrepreneurs. Um, but first, I think it's helpful to start out by just indicating why I think it matters to think about authors as entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, when anyone, almost anyone uh, in our field talks about uh, the justif justifications for copyright, um, they still cite the classic utilitarian incentive-based rationale, the two-stage model that Professor Murgis uh, just outlined this morning. And that's the, this idea, as he said, that granting exclusive rights and creative works incentivizes their production by ensuring that authors have an opportunity to recoup uh, their investment in production, um, and in return for that grant of rights, they get uh, um, uh, that limit access, um, uh, but also free writing. Society gets the benefit of enjoying works that would otherwise not have been produced. Um, but authors' rights are limited to ensure sufficient public access to works, and therefore the rights, and this again is that classic sort of utilitarian model, the rights that are granted are only granted to the extent that they incentivize the production of wor new works. And so the default, if you will, uh, is uh, of the classic utilitarian story is that authors have no presumed right to profit from their innovations. We tolerate uh, granting these rights to the proceeds of their labor only to the extent that it's necessary to incentivize um, creative activity. Therefore, if an author would have created a work without the extrinsic incentives of copyright, then granting rights in that work is social waste because it would have been created anyway. Again, from Professor Murgis's, uh, uh talk, we see that sort of, that's the, the model in which many uh, academics um, still operate. And this even leads some academics to conclude that copyright should be abolished if it can be established that authors would create for intrinsic reasons independent of the extrinsic copyright incentives. Now, that got me thinking about how we treat innovation in sort of other spheres of the economy and got me thinking about entrepreneurs. And looking at entrepreneurial theory in the literature on entrepreneurs, um, uh, it tells a very different story. So interestingly, these kinds of questions do not preoccupy economic theories of the entrepreneur. Nobody talks about capping entrepreneurs' entitlements uh, at the precise level necessary to incentivize entrepreneurial uh, activity. Nobody asks, to what extent would Sergey Brin and Larry Page have founded Google without financial incentives or suggest that their rights to their shares in Google should be limited based on, um, based on uh, uh, whatever persuasion costs were necessary to get them to uh, engage in that activity in the first place? Um, uh, uh, nobody suggests if entrepreneurs would engage in their work for primarily intrinsic reasons, they should be denied, denied uh, rights to compensation. So in other words, it's generally treated as self-evident in the entrepreneurial scholarship that um, entrepreneurs have the right to whatever profits they can lawfully derive from their commercial activities. Um, so I think there's a double standard here that deserves some scrutiny. Uh, and it's worth asking whether authors and entrepreneurs are, as the literature, literature tends to treat them, entirely distinct creatures. Um, so I looked at some of the literature on entrepreneurship theory, and there's sort of three key qualities. If it's, 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 as you can imagine, very complex, but, um, but there are kind of three key qualities that seem to keep emerging to the surface in the literature that kind of identify or make one an entrepreneur. The first is free agency. Entrepreneurs are distinguished from salary workers. This goes back all the way to Cantillon 
um, sort of the first uh, economic theory uh, theorist on entrepreneurship, um, and this idea that um, many entrepreneurs, in fact, go it alone to have the freedom and, uh, and, and autonomy um, uh, um, authors uh, are typically free agents as well, right? So making this connection between authors and entrepreneurs. Authors are typically free agents as well. Um, and in fact, many creatives say that they get into uh, their creative work in order to have independence, right? Um, financial freedom and professional autonomy. Um, Professor Murgis actually wrote uh, at length in his book, Justifying Intellectual Property, that um, Professor O'Connor mentioned earlier um, about the importance of authors' autonomy interests and the importance of autonomy as a motivation for authors. And he also contrasts um, the author with salaried workers. So there are, again, very uh, 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 distinct connections. Um, the second uh, sort of uh, featured characteristic, of, if you will, of um, entrepreneurs is risk-taking in the face of market uncertainty. So as free agents, entrepreneurs are typically vulnerable to the uncertainties of, uh, and risks that arise from interacting um, with the open market. Um, there's no guarantee that there will be market demand for a work, and we see this in, um, you know, in, in many instances where famous authors uh, create works that flops, that flop, and unknown authors uh, create a hit out of the blue. Okay. Um, and lastly, innovation is a key core precept of, uh, of entrepreneurship. Taking risks isn't enough to make you an entrepreneur. You have to innovate. Uh, the economist Peter Drucker talks about this and says, um, that the person who opens a corner convenience store doubtless takes an economic risk, but if they're not innovating, that doesn't make them an entrepreneur. Um, uh, 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 in uh, uh, Schumpeter's words, uh, who's, who's probably viewed as the, the, uh, the, 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 still the leader in sort of the field of entrepreneurship studies, entrepreneurs create, create um, uh, uh, new combinations out of existing elements. That defines their, their, um, their uh, innovation. And I think it's fair to say that that's exactly what authors do. Um, they innovate for a living. They create combinations out of existing elements. And in doing so, drive um, uh, the creative economies forward. Okay. Um, now, importantly, since this is the commercialization panel, it's not just innovation that's enough to make you an entrepreneur. It has to be innovation plus commercialization, right? And we also see that as authors as well. And one of the important roles that copyright plays is that actually, in addition to, be, uh, to being a set of exclusive rights, um, it also forms a kind of platform, almost an entity, if you will, around which different economic can actors can coordinate their activities Right, um, in order to help the author bring uh, a work from the conception stage um, to the market and distribution stage, the kind of work that um, Professor Merges um, has been uh, talking about. Um, uh, all right, um, I think we have 10 minutes, is that right? So I'm basically out of time, is that right? Okay, <laughs> so I have plenty more to say about this. Um, but uh, but um, I will add that um, what, um, or I'll, I'll just finish with a, a teaser and I'll say what, what I think the, the, the general response um, from those who are more skeptical of copyright would be is, well, look, we have no problem with authors being entrepreneurs and we have no problem with authors having the same, in effect, unfettered rights to the proceeds of their authorial uh, act activities as the typical entrepreneur. The problem we have is that authors, it surrounds the goods that author pro authors produce, not, um, not the fact that uh, authors are innovative and free agents and um, face market risks. And so our concern is the monopoly power that's conferred by IP rights. And I have a response to that, but that's going to be the cliffhanger because I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. And we can probably circle back to some of that uh, during your Q&A.
And now I'll uh, ask Paul to come up. Thank you. Hi, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today. As it says, my name is Paul Zielinski. I'm with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And so one of the first things I really want to just discuss is why am I here in the first place, I suppose, is a great question. For those of you who aren't familiar with what NIST is, we're actually a part of the Department of Commerce. And so along with other bureaus, such as the Patent and Trademark Office, the International Trade Administration, we look at these issues of IP as a way to actually advance commerce within the United States, basically how are people going to make money. So we have a bunch of people working in a number of different groups which I'm engaged in. And it's not exactly a new issue with um, this whole idea of how do we use IP, how do we leverage our IP in order to increase the investment that we have in our research programs in the economy. So basically, what is the impact of these things going to be and why are we bothering to do these things if we're actually not benefiting our folks in the United States? Like I said, there's a number of different groups. I'm not going to go through all of them all together. But I think it's important to note that a lot of this is actually raised up into a little bit larger level at the moment. Uh, within the president's management agenda, you have what's called cross-agency priority goals, and that's a lot of government speak. I think one of the most important things that you really can get out of this whole idea of this cross-agency priority goal, which, by the way, we're co-chaired between NIST and the Office of Science and Technology Policy within the uh, executive office of the president, more than anything, if I want to communicate this, if you look at the president's management agenda for President Trump, this is the one item that actually was also in the president's management agenda for President Obama. And I think that really communicates something very, very powerful. So for all of the things that people can disagree with on the other side of the river from where we sit right now, they all agree on this issue. What we do with intellectual property is really critically important to advancing our economic position in the world. And that's not just about what we're doing here in the United States, it's actually really a global thing. How do we compete with other countries? How do we compete with business, businesses in those other countries? And how do we make sure we're really helping our economy advance in the global setting? So within this lab to market, we have actually what we call strategies. We have a lovely buzzwords for all of these things within the government. One of the first things we want to look at is actually our regulatory regime. Where are we at within our legal system and within the regulations that really underlie that as well? So we want to look at these things. Our basis for intellectual property rights from a government setting, from our side, really states back to 1980 by Dolak, Stevenson, Weidler Act. Well, we're getting on 40 years now. The world has changed a bit since I owned a Commodore 64 and sitting on there, you know, not a whole lot of IP out there regarding software, for example. The world has changed. You know, our economy, when we uh, look at it back in 2016, for example, the Bureau of Economic Analysis estimated $1.2 trillion of our economy was actually in digital products. So we got to change the way we're thinking about these things. We actually have to think it, you know, as was brought up by our keynote speaker, Professor Merges, you know, the world is different than the way we used to think of these things. So we really need to keep up with the times. Um, we actually, so we need to upgrade our systems and we need to really upgrade the actually underlying laws and regulations that are there. So one of the most important things in that regards, actually, and as you just saw in our keynote speak, of course, is the role of the private sector. So it's investment. You know, you look at what the government puts in. We put in a lot of money in research and development. But it's actually that investor that's going to take that first Series A funding that's going to get a company up and running. And so I know the big money is out there when the in the scale up, the development, the advanced manufacturing, we pay attention to all those things. But one of the things we're really trying to focus on is how you get those startup companies actually, or a, a new product line, actually some level of investment that's going to get it actually from this idea stage into the marketplace. So you've heard a lot about that. I'm sure that's going to be a repeating theme. But it's critically important. And when you look at our position and the way our country and our economy is structured, this is sort of the secret sauce of the US economy. We don't do a lot of government investment in terms of saying, we think this is going to be a great idea. This is our five-year plan in order to get a company started up. That's not the way we operate. We trust the private sector is going to have private investment based on what they see as products and services that people want to buy. They're going to get a return on their investment. That actually is what drives our innovation cycle is private investment, not just the government investment. In fact, very much definitely not the government investment. But it is actually that bet that you're making from the private sector that there is going to be a return on your investment. Of course, along with that, we want to enforce this idea of an entrepreneurial workforce. We have to make sure people have the skills. You know, if you're going to compete against a nation state with a mom and pop shop, you've got to be pretty good. So we want to make sure that people are educated, they actually have the skills, not only, for example, intellectual property rights, but how do you actually get a business up and running? How do you get a technology 
across that bridge and into the marketplace. And of course, that also means we have to do some level of investment in making sure that our folks can actually find, use, understand, and basically transfer these technologies. And that gets into actually making sure we're providing these tools and services. And then finally, everybody knows the old adage, what gets measured gets done. But that's the, the real point is actually shifting from looking at how we're doing better than last year to really how are we competing against other nations. How is our innovation system not only just, you know, do we do a little bit more than we did last year, you know, or is that trend line going up, but actually how is that doing against other benchmarks across, you know, other countries that are doing uh, a lot better than us if you look at that trend line in terms of just the rate. Now, we still have a lot of leadership in many areas, but you know, our rate is a lot slower than other countries. So we actually want to measure that. How are we looking at these things and actually shifting from just counting outputs? Are we doing more patents? Are we doing you know, cooperative research and development agreements? Are we doing more stuff to actually looking at the academic impact of these things? And so we're shifting to measuring things in more of a uh, academic economic model if you will, and looking at what are our studies telling us, looking back and looking at what lessons can we learn bringing those into the future. So one of the things that we've kicked off, going sort of a little bit more uh, focused inwards, is this thing we call our return on investment initiative. It's actually part of this larger setup. So it's actually looking at this idea of the framework. Um, I mentioned federal dollars. We invest about $150 billion of your hard-earned tax money every year in research and development. That's a lot of money. It's your money. Uh, hopefully we spend it well, uh, but we intend to, like I said, we want to focus on getting these things not just out into a laboratory and it's great that we've got some wonderful, you know, academic research, not to put the academic research down at all, but we really want to see a return on that. We want to see those products reach what Congress call, tells us is practical application, something that gets into the marketplace, and that's really what we're focusing on. So we put out last year what we call our green paper, which is just more or less to say it's an idea paper, nothing that we're going to say this is absolutely the policy of the federal government. But it did give us a chance to actually put some things out there in the public and actually receive a lot of feedback from the public. So we started off doing a big requ a, uh, request for public you know, input on this document. We did, you know, we had months of an open period which actually got extended because we got shut down for a little while, but then again, at the same time, that kept going, and we got more public input. We actually went across the country. We had multiple um, comments. You know, wrote, We had a bit of a road show with meetings that we could get people to come up and tell us what they thought. We put out a draft. We got comments back on the draft, and we actually did this thing, key findings. Well, you know, this is a government term, basically saying we're not, you know, it's a green paper. We're not committing to these things. But there were some key things that we put out there in terms of what do we need to do to change the structure of the way we approach intellectual property, entrepreneurship, and basically this whole idea of transitioning across this bridge from the laboratory to the marketplace. So uh, more to come on that, but I just wanted to give the introduction and the framework for it, and I will turn it back over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, George, you're up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much to CPIP. Kevin, thank you so much. I also want to give a special thanks to Christina, who did a, a tremendous job organizing this panel this morning uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and the, the conference overall. Incredible thanks to the Antonin Scalia Law School as well. I'm super excited to be back uh, with uh, CPIP this morning. It reminds me, two years ago I was on the stage uh, with a distinguished alumni of CPIP and a few others, uh, and we started talking about whether FTAs, free trade agreements, were a good idea. And uh, back then, maybe perhaps a little bit naive, just coming out of USTR, I said, well, sure, they're great. Um, then I've gone through and been in the private sector a little while and been working hard on issues that are controversial and sensitive that key senators have different views on, and I'm not so sure about FTAs anymore. Um, so anyway, lo long story short is out of that conversation came an idea uh, to create a group called the Digital Creators Working Group, which is about 35 create, uh, creative organizations uh, here in town representing the creative industries. And we've really begun to work about how can we affect FTAs, but also how can we work below the FTA level um, to manage and promote uh, strong copyright protection and enforcement globally. So I just want to thank CPIP uh, for uh, helping me uh, to inspire a big group of us uh, to, to think more broadly and to think more strategically about protecting and promoting intellectual property rights. This morning I want to talk a little bit about the commercial function of intellectual property rights, especially copyright, from the perspective of the sound recording industry. 
Um, I want to focus on how, uh, specifically about how licensing can drive, uh, as, a, as the licensing of an intangible asset is a, effectively a commercial function, right? How can it drive many positive contributions, not only to the music industry, the music ecosystem in the United States and globally, but to many other economies? So we think about the streaming economy and how much copyright licensing has been the driver if not the key driver, one of the main drivers of the streaming economy that we see today. At six o'clock when people go home and turn on Netflix, it changes the economy, right? It changes the amount of piracy on the internet. It changes the amount of uh, broadband usage. It, dr it drives investment. It changes the way we live in our world, right? And that's a, that's, that's a result of the commercial function of IP. I also want to talk about the U.S. economy, the positive contributions of copyright licensing on the U.S. economy in terms of jobs, growth, trade, and other metrics that we think that we have used to evaluate the positive economic impacts of these issues. I also want to talk about um, the digital economy, how <coughs> copyright licensing actually promotes new economies, right? The digital economy, social media, um, video platforms, and a whole host of other economies that didn't used to exist and probably wouldn't exist without copyright licensing. So in less than 10 minutes, I will get through all of that. Uh, <laughs> and finally, I'd like to, uh, we may, I may say a few words on some of the distortions in the copyright licensing marketplace that effectively defeat or otherwise distort or diminish the commercial function of, of copyright and, and the ability to license. So first, turning to the streaming economy, um, I just have a few numbers here to kind of help, help uh, crystallize what I'm talking about. First of all, um, streaming now for the re sound recording industry in the United States accounts for 80% of our total revenues. So we, we have become in the sound recording industry, and I see MPA here, um, uh, we, we, we in the sound recording industry are among the most digital industries uh, in the United States. We fundamentally revolutionized our business model. We went from CD plants and you know, commercial distribution and um, tower records, right? And now we've gone to Spotify and Apple and Amazon, and there's this other thing called YouTube, but I'll turn back to that in a second. Um, so it's fundamentally changed our industry. We have 60 million uh, streaming subscribers, subscribers today, and that's growing. And globally, that number is also growing steadily and significantly around the world. There are several markets uh, around the world where streaming accounts for over 80%. For example, in China, it's 90%. China jumped last year to this year from 10th to 7th largest music industry uh, market in the world driven by streaming. So just to get a sense of copyright licensing is, is, is effectively helping to drive or is a fundamental piece uh, of this economy. And globally, so we have some important statistics here as well. So we've had last year to this year, we've had a 30 to over 32% increase in paid streaming revenues. So that's important for a healthy music ecosystem. Uh, obviously, Google is uh, not really contributing to that so much, so we'd like to see that change. Um, we also see an increase of 46.9% of streaming shares of revenue, right? So of total revenue globally, we're nearly, uh, we're nearly at 50% uh, in terms of streaming. And we have 50 markets around the world where streaming accounts for over 50% of total recording industry revenues in those markets. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. We have some markets, interestingly Japan, where physical goods still uh, outpace streaming, and those are historical and uh, legacy reasons. But in most markets around the world, Germany, for example, just switched uh, from digital to physical as the leading part of revenue. Um, so this is, this is where the future is. Streaming is where, thanks to copyright licensing, where uh, our return to growth in the music industry is happening. So what, is, what, is, what, is, what does that revenue mean? So we often talk about IP not as an end in itself, but as a means, right? Uh, Professor uh, Merge's site was saying before, and I completely uh, share this point, what's the real practical effect of all this? It's great to earn revenues, but it's also great to pay rent. It's also great to put food on the table, right? It's also great to send your kids to school and do all those things that, to enjoy life and live a good life. And that's what, this, that's what this economy does. And so I'll spend a, a few very short minutes talking about that partnership between the sound recording industry and our artists. And always, it, 
remains for us in our industry always the focus is on the artists and it's always focused on the human real world implications of this industry on our users and their quality of life and promoting a sound ecosystem in music we love justin bieber we love taylor swift but we also love other genres and the ability to invest in all using copyright licensing through streaming and other forms of uh, the commercial functions of ip we endeavor to invest to create a full, wholesome, wholesome thriving um, music ecosystem that benefits not only our industry, but our artists for sure, and users, uh, and many others as well. So you see here just a quick, a quick note that we are, we are increasing in terms of the number of new artists that we're always bringing into the fold. And this, this diagram hopefully shows, and hopefully you can see it, it shows again, artists are at the center of our work, and what a good, healthy music ecosystem looks like. These are all the ways that the sound recording industry invests in the artist, right? There's artist and uh, repertoire, which is a major, major part of what our industry does, and marketing. Together, we reinvest 27% of our revenues back into A&R and marketing. It may not be an exact comparison, but if you think about R&D, research and development, the thing that investment goes to and IP protects we're at 20, if we're at 27%, that's a very large part of our revenue. Um, economists may want to talk through my methodology on that for sure, but um, it's a large part. So seeing that I'm uh, running out of time, so I want to talk about the U.S. economy. Here's the positive contributions of the U.S. economy uh, of, the, of the music industry. So you see um, our contributions to GDP, our trade surplus, so IP licensing, that's not just the music industry, but that's all the sponsors of today's conference you see on the board. Pharma, Bio, BSA, us, um, others. 80 billion trade surplus. That is the largest or second largest, depending on markets, of our digital trade surplus in the world. That's staggering. That's IP licensing. That's the commercial function of IP driving a trade surplus, which we do not have in the United States in goods. We also see the number of music businesses we have in the United States also benefiting uh, from, uh, from copyright and licensing and so forth. And then finally, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, social media, right? So social media, if I went on musicfuels.com uh, this morning, 10 out of the 10 top most followed, I know you all were on this website this morning as well. Um, <laughs> 10 of the 10 most followed um, individuals on uh, all social media platforms aggregated um, are musicians. You get an occasional soccer star. Kardashian. Uh, you get a Kardashian. Uh, you get a former president or two um, uh, are, who are also top, but across all platforms. So this is what brings people to social media. This is what brings people to um, music video platforms like YouTube. And the key is, are they being fairly remunerated? So one of those distortions that we talk about uh, in the digital ecosystem that effectively distorts or diminishes, deprives the economic value of copyright licensing are overbroad copyright safe harbors. And I see many of our good friends from PTO and uh, other embassies and Go US UK FTA. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and even, from, even from the House, uh, so happy to see everyone here. And obviously these copyright uh, overbroad safe harbors make it very difficult for copyright owners to license their music, right? It, we used to make more money in the sound recording industry from selling vinyl records than we earned from YouTube. That was two years ago. Um, and so that's, that shows that something's wrong. We lose about 650 million to a billion a year because of the copyright safe harbors and their ability that prevents the United States from, or the, the sound recording industry in the United States from properly licensing at a fair market rate uh, with major music video platforms like YouTube. So anyway, I'll, I'll wrap it up, but look forward to answering some questions and thanks again. All right, thank you, George. And finally, we have Rob. So thank you, Kevin. Let me start by disclosing a critical fact that I am a swideless person. <laughs> when Kevin asked me yesterday whether I would be interested and available to talk today on this topic, I leaped at the opportunity, rescheduled my workout to 6 a.m. with my trainer, and I'm here today. Why is this topic so important? because we're talking about practicing entities. We're not talking about non-practicing entities. 
We're talking about U.S. companies of all sizes that are trying to sell products and services in the global economy of today. A radically different proposition than even two or three years ago based on my professional experience. Last, last week at this time, I was meeting with the European Patent Office, top people, and the German Federal Patent Court in Munich after having spoken with a colleague of mine from our firm at a conference of top German and European companies uh, on Wednesday and Thursday dealing with globalization and how German and European companies can deal with this new global economy using patents and utility models uh, as their primary mode of protection in these rapidly developing economies. I can tell you that the topic that I was asked to speak on, which I think is one of the most critical issues facing our U.S. ecosystem in terms of the patents uh, world, is the subject of injunction. I was talking about what is really happening in the real world concerning preliminary and permanent injunctions in the United States courts, and also what's going on with exclusion orders at the International Trade Commission. And my slide deck for that topic, I will make available, Kevin, so that each of you can have this. I would also like to say that I write a weekly newsletter that many of you get, I know, it's about 2,500 people, called Focus 2019. And in the latest issue that came out this Wednesday, I summarized what was discussed from the German and European perspective, including the UK, and what, what it could be the ramifications of hard Brexit on Halloween, which is October 31 in this country. So my perspective comes from representing two companies. I want to summarize. One, I'll disclose their name, Align, which makes Invisalign. And I've been involved in their global enforcement of their very successful product, the Invisalign device, which some of us have used around the world. And I've been involved in their validity fights uh, over their patents with a competitor in Denmark. In addition, I was asked to architect and implement a global enforcement program about three years ago for a company that went from 70 people to 2,600 in 24 months, which saw their market cap go from a quarter of a billion to $40 billion. So how does a company of a, making a consumer product that enjoys in immediate commercial success deal with an intellectual property regime in the United States, in Europe, and in China, Japan, and South Korea, to name five jurisdictions? How does a company deal with that kind of situation when the counterfeiters start within days of the release of their product. And we have people in this room who I've worked with who've seen exactly that happen to their product. They release their product, and the infringement starts almost within a week of the product coming out. So we're not talking about theory here. We're talking about the real world. Why is this such a problem? Well, we know why it's a problem because things can be knocked off almost instantly these days. I don't care how complicated it is. And it can be shipped into various jurisdictions by the counterfeiters, the imitators, the copyists, whatever they are, as fast as you can imagine. And our intellectual property regimes, whether they be patents, utility models, design patents, whether they be trademarks, trade secrets, I'm not gonna discuss copyrights, they don't work fast enough in the real world to really prevent the kind of poaching, the kind of theft, to use Dave Kapos's words, that is going on today. And I call this whole effort that I'm involved in for practicing entities protecting the red zone. And what I mean by this is, if you were to draw a graph and you show the actual sales or the actual profits that a company makes over the course of 36 months from the release of a consumer product. And then you look at the actual market uh, for that product, those sales and those profits. 
that actually occurred if the product is a big success, which of course what we're talking about today, there is a large zone of money that is never ever seen by the, by the originator, the creator, whatever you want to call it. And that return on investment for their IP investment is significantly reduced from what it should be. And the legal systems in our country and in China and Europe are all dealing with this issue. The unfortunate thing is that from a practical point of view, it, it, there are mechanisms in Germany with their utility models, the German patents, the German injunction gap, which is in our slide deck, that allow an, an innovator to go to Germany and enforce rights very effectively in very short amount of time. And the same thing is occurring in China if you believe the writings of Chief Judge Rader and others. They're creating a system that allows for very prompt obtaining of rights and enforcement of those rights. In the United States, we have fast track, which is a godsend uh, for innovators in this country and something that we should all be very appreciative of. But the problem is when you go to our courts and you try to seek injunctive relief, you're probably not going to get it because of eBay and how eBay has been interpreted. And the problem is that you can get injunctive relief in, in Germany, you can get injunctive relief in China, you can get injunctive relief in Japan and South Korea, but you cannot get injunctive relief in this country, even if you're a practicing entity under most circumstances. And I should tell you one final point before I stop, there is huge forces going on in Germany today from the German car industry to basically weaken the automatic injunction that you now have in Germany because those industries are deathly afraid of, frankly, the United States electronics industry as they move into the automotive sector. So we live in a very dynamic world and you have to be extremely practical in how you deal with how to stop this infringement because if you cannot stop this infringement, do not fool yourself. You never get fully compensated by the courts. And essentially, it's, it's an economy that is based on rewarding the copyist, the infringer, and the counterfeiter to much higher a degree than should be permitted. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to all the panelists for these presentations. Um, I, I do want to leave a couple minutes at the end for audience Q&A, but um, I do have some, a few follow-up questions of my own. And, and maybe if I could start with you, Paul. Um, so you got into a little bit towards the end of your presentation the, the return on investment green paper that NIST put out recently. And I, I, I was looking it over the other day, and I know that it's, part of it is dedicated to talking about some of the the uncertainty surrounding government margin rights. And this is something that CPIP has, has been looking into over the past few months as well. So, um, you know, especially how they apply to the commercialization of, of pharmaceutical drugs. Um, you know, some are calling of late to use margin rights to combat high drug prices. And I was wondering if you could discuss how controlling drug prices um, was not really within the scope of the intent of the margin rights. and and maybe how more clarity on the practical application and reasonable terms would help us better understand uh, when margin rights should and should not be invoked? Sure, thank you, that's a great question. One of the biggest things we actually see often, I mean, it's been in the Washington Post, it's been all over, um, you know, this whole idea of what's in the green paper related to, this, to the uh, whole drug pricing issue. To be honest with you, it's not really directed only at drug pricing. If you look within the Bayh-Dole Act, it actually has a piece within the definition for, you know, or the goal it basically says in the Bayh-Dole Act is practical application. I think everybody knows that. The definition says what, is, what does that mean? And it includes this phrase that talks about um, at a reasonable price. And that really kind of gets into this whole idea because if you look at what happens, the government can march in on, which is to basically say we're gonna, base, we're gonna take it back we're going, to let, we're going to issue a license to a competitor in order to produce a product. We're not going to produce it. That's not what the government does. However, the big point of this whole idea is to better define what that means because it gets very uh, often misinterpreted. 
Our interpretation, as you can see within the discussion in that green paper, is actually the idea that, and first of all, we've never used the government march and write, ever. So it's almost 40 years since this has been passed, hasn't been used, which is a really strong thing to say. Now that's not to say that we haven't actually had to have discussions with people about it, that's a different story. But we actually have never had to do the actual physical march in to take, write, and issue a license to another party. However, um, when you look at the idea of reasonable terms, what does that mean? Well, you know, the regime that's set up under Baidol is how we actually move technologies from the laboratory to the marketplace. That's not to say that we are in the consumer market. We're not. We're the government. We don't make and sell products to a consumer. So we're trying to actually affect the transition of the technology to a company. And so when we, we're interpreting this, um, as we put forth in the green paper, as meaning it's actually the terms of the license are reasonable terms, not whatever someone does 10 years later in the consumer marketplace. So it actually is a matter of trying to protect that intellectual property, right? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's all about this investment idea, right? So if you're gonna have your investment and the government takes it away and gives it to another company, you've just lost your investment or a good chunk of it, as was just discussed. So it really is a matter of really trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And, it, and it's more than just, you know, it's a sort of a slippery slope idea. So it's more than just drug pricing. You know, you can apply this to all sorts of different things. You can apply it in electronics. You can apply it to hybrid vehicles. You can apply it to any new product or service that has any value. And where is the government going to take a role in actually then disrupting that marketplace and all those market forces in favor of setting up a pricing regime? And so we're kind of pulling back. There's, I mean, I don't want to play high drug prices either, frankly, but there's a lot of other mechanisms other than destroying our intellectual property basis in this country. Thanks. And I guess maybe one other thing I wanted to ask about coming from the green paper, um, I know it discusses government works software um, and how it doesn't have the copyright protections needed to provide effective licenses. Um, and I wanted to ask you maybe if you could talk briefly about how this lack of IP protection limits creators' ability to ensure integrity and control and, and ultimately hinders investments that might otherwise help commercialization um, and product development. Sure. Again, this is another one that is probably one of the bigger issues that comes out in the green paper. And it actually requires, so the other one, the, um, we do expect that we can put, issue a regulation around this idea of the um, you know, reasonable terms part I just talked about. This one really is a legislative issue. And, you know, this has a very long history, so you've got over 100 years, 120 years, roughly, of a base principle of the, you can't copyright government works. And that's all well and good when you think about the normal things that the government produces. It makes a lot of sense. However, as I mentioned, you know, when you start looking at our new economy, as was just mentioned, with streaming services and, you know, what are we doing in a digital economy? It's you know, over a trillion dollars of economic development, one of the fastest growing sectors in the economy. And we basically put ourselves on the sidelines. You know, we look at patents as a way to transfer the right to a company in order to raise capital, in order to get into the marketplace. We can't do that with software. And so we were actually looking at perhaps having a narrow field for developers so that we can put something out there to a company that they can then gather some investment in in order to launch their product. You know, again, we don't want to disrupt this. It's not a matter of basically saying, you know, we're going to take all these rights. But it does get into sort of the heart of content provider versus content developer. And where is that investment really coming in? And, you know, the investment often comes in on the development side. Mm -hmm. And so we're really trying to see if we can use what we've successfully looked at in the patent regime and trying to see how we can apply that because patents are not the best tool often when you start thinking about software and digital products. And so we, have, we want to start looking at the copyright area, particularly when you start looking at how we compete. You know, again, I keep talking about this global economy. And if we've sidelined ourselves from protecting our companies in this, then we're just basically pu pushing our products overseas. And, uh, you know, we really want to help grow domestic markets. Thanks. Uh, so, George, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I was reading the, uh, the RAA's update they sent to the USTR on the notorious markets list. Um, I think it was just sent this week. Um, you know, it talks about how infringing activity continues to, to distort legitimate markets and, and undermine the music industry in many ways. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you about, it, it talks about these various uh, forms of self-help, you know, sending cease and desist letters, take down notices, litigation that, you know, while sometimes can be effective, really, are not able to meet the challenges um, you know, that you get with whack-a-mole. It's, it's still a challenge in domain hopping. 
So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the things that uh, an organization like ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, uh, but also a website hosting service like Cloudflare could do to help enforcement efforts. Kevin, many thanks, not only for a, a very good question, but for reading our submission. Uh, you're, you're one of our VIP status uh, uh, readers of our, of our uh, highly scintillating uh, reports, uh, as always. Thank you, thank you again. Um, and, and really a, a great question. So obviously, we have to be engaged and we have to work through every possible mechanism that we have for on behalf of our industry to address online piracy um, and, and digital infringement. Um, but there are certain structural challenges to a digital marketplace, and you've identified two. So most people are aware of the uh, European Union's um, general data protection regulation, and that has um, disturbed fundamentally, hopefully that's not, not too much of an exaggeration, the who is database. So this is the database of, of, of names and other information for uh, actors online. This is something that is relied on heavily, not only by the copyright intensive industries to go after online piracy, but of course by law enforcement officials around the world, including in the United States, to go after other um, actors engaging in illicit content. I can, and that, that European Union uh, regulation has effectively shut off access to this who is system. And so that's a major problem and it has deep systemic uh, negative impacts on the digital, uh, digital piracy effort and digital law enforcement generally. Um, so the question is, why is ICANN involved? And the answer, and so we often ask ourselves that, um, but in this instance, ICANN was involved in endeavoring to, tr to try to find some kind of resolution on a global scale to address this challenge, right, of how, how to implement and facilitate the continued, um, the continued use of the internet, right, in the ways that it was intended, including with respect to law enforcement. And they have yet to do that, and so that's become very frustrating, um, and as a result, certain registrars and registries are now endeavoring to comply, and I'm being very diplomatic here, are endeavoring to comply with the GDPR, this European Union regulation, and as a result, are not being able to, are not giving over this information, which is critical to our ability. And so they invite us uh, to, to bring legal action, and, and that's, of course, very expensive, and it has fundamentally delayed the process, right? Something that was automatic has now become a, a, a judicial process. Um, so, so that is something, so the answer is what can I can do? It needs to move expeditiously to address this problem. The European Union regulation includes very clear language about legitimate public policy purposes. This is clearly one and this should be explicit. Mm -hmm. um, so I can needs to move forward and members of the international community, both governments, but all the internet stakeholders need to come together. And by the way, there is broad, um, there is broad um, support within the digital community. So, so sometimes there's a false paradigm parallel between you know, tech and content. And here there's often quite, quite a, a large amount of convergence. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing. You mentioned Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a U.S. company that, uh, as many know, that uh, provides something called reverse proxy services. This is something, and it does other services as well. Uh, and some of it's totally legitimate. Um, but unfortunately, some of their clients are, are totally illegitimate. Some of them are massive copyright infringers, but some of them are other organizations that engage in, in highly illegal activities. Uh, and that's appeared multiple times in the press, including terrorist organizations and other entities. So that's a problem. Um, but for specifically for us, Cloudflare is helpful in that when we pass along an infringing website to Cloudflare, they then um, will give us the information about, the, uh, about their client, which is helpful, right? That, that's important. Uh, but at the same time, then they notify their client and their, their client jumps. Right, still uses Cloudflare but jumps. So this notice process keeps main, creates another, an entirely new whack-a-mole system. I was in Asia, in Thailand, two years ago, uh, meeting with all of our the record industry's regional groups, so all of our national groups in every territory in Asia, and they said the number one most problematic website or web service in the world aren't all the pirate sites that reside in Asia or or in or in certain parts of maybe Russia or Ukraine but it's, it's Cloudflare, because mm -hmm. all, so many websites that are, that are engaging in systemic copyright piracy are using Cloudflare. So Cloudflare needs to uh, do a better job of being more aggressive uh, with respect to this, this, this fundamental challenge that goes well beyond copyright piracy. Mm -hmm. So, sounds like more work to be done. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, Eric, I wanted to, to shift back to your presentation, because I, uh, I 
find it intriguing, and, and I was able to read the draft you sent me. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask about was something that you mentioned um, might be a, an area you might get pushback is when people who might want to make a distinction between authors and entrepreneurs would look at the goods produced by authors and say that they're, well, these are non-rivalrous. Um, but you actually argue that this distinct in, distinction doesn't matter and that, if anything, this entrepreneurial theory would, would support providing more copyright protection because of the risks authors expose themselves to, um, more so than that of traditional physical goods. And I was hoping you could maybe just talk a little bit more about this non-rivalrous rivalrous distinction. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, the only difference between, as I see it, between, uh, I, I just think it's, it's hard to make a, pr a principal distinction between authors and what we think of as entrepreneurs in every other sector, um, except for the goods that authors produce. And it's just sort of the unhappy circumstance for authors that they produce information goods, which are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. And that means going back to uh, Professor Merges' uh, L-shaped marginal cost curve, um, the problem is that we're worried that the authors are going to have these sunk costs that they can't reproduce in the face of um, free writing. And so, in a way, the key question is, um, you know, I think authors check off all the boxes for what we call entrepreneurs. Um, but the question is, does the fact that authors produce non-rival risk goods justify treating them differently from all other entrepreneurs. And when I say treating them differently, um, I mean in copyright scholarship, they are really treated differently to the point where uh, copyright scholars have no problem talking about, um, you know, well, gee, how much should we reduce authors' uh, right to compensation in order to incentivize them to produce um, more works. Uh, uh, Mark Lemley, um, in an article from some years ago called Property, Intellectual Property and Free Writing, actually has a whole subsection entitled, What's Wrong with Overcompensating Authors? Right? Um, and goes on and talks about what's wrong with overcompensating authors. And we just don't see that. Nobody talks about um, what's, you know, how, how could we, how could we uh, generate more entrepreneurial activity if we actually compensate entrepreneurs less? Right? Um, and uh, and so um, so yeah so this this question of um, does the fact that we have this one difference that authors produce uh, non rivalrous goods make um, make a difference and it's it's actually a, a complicated question um, but uh, uh, but sort of you know in the the two minute response that I have is I, I think um, that that. Uh, much too much is made out of this distinction. First of all, um, without copyright, it's just much harder for authors to directly monetize their creative labor, directly monetize. They can monetize it in sort of ancillary revenue streams. You know, they can sell merchandise, go on lecture tours, that sort of thing. Um, but that's not the gold standard for compensation that we see for other uh, uh, entrepreneurs in entrepreneurial theory. The gold standard is rewarding risk-taking and rewarding innovative contributions. And so rewarding the direct contributions that, uh, that entrepreneurs make. Um, and, and by doing so, we promote the goals of rewarding labor and promoting autonomy, which in fact happen to be exactly the fundamental tenets of not just entrepreneurial theory, but Professor Murgis's view in his um, excellent book um, on what IP is supposed to do as well. So while, yeah, copyright confers a, a nominal monopoly, um, that's kind of a quirky consequence of the nature of the goods. Um, a couple of other things that I think copyright does um, that, uh, uh, that make it sort of, um, uh, or that, that uh, make this distinction um, less important is that it, it puts authors on the same footing as entrepreneurs and enables them to co commercialize their works in the same way that other entrepreneurs um, are able to do. Uh, uh, because copyright owners are uniquely vulnerable, 
right? Um, and, and this is something that often gets lost in the literature. They're uniquely vulnerable because of the nature of this non-rivalrous, non-excludable nature of the goods they produce. And so um, copyright skeptics actually often put copyright um, and author, uh, copyright as, as putting authors, they state it as it puts authors in a supra-competitive position. But in fact, authors start out right at a competitive disadvantage when compared to other entrepreneurs in every, it, that produce rivalrous goods, right? Um, and so copyright really remedies this inequity as opposed to kind of putting them in this super competitive um, advantage. So from my view, ultimately, what we're talking about, it comes down to competition policy. All, all of this discussion about authors and, um, and, and the scope of their rights comes down to competition policy and access to information. And I just think it's really eminently doable to have a copyright system that both effectively and fairly rewards the labor of authors while at the same time being sufficiently um, uh, uh, leaky and open to maximize access and, um, and um, minimize the anti-competitive effects of copyright. Thanks. Again, really cool project. Looking forward to the, the final product. Um, we're, we're getting close to our time here, but I, I did want to give uh, the audience an opportunity to, to jump in uh, with any questions they might have. So I think we have time for one or two if uh, anyone is dying to uh, ask one of our panelists here. Sure. I have a question for Ross. Um, There's a mic coming to you. Some of your uh, concerns for knockoff uh, products. I mean, any of us can go to Alibaba's one off site AliExpress, and I can order level four chest protectors for SWAT teams. I can order $3,000 scopes for $100. And some of those things aren't knockoffs. Some of those things are our clients deciding they're going to manufacture there, and they make 1,000 units, and they make the profit off our client, and they make 10,000 more units, and they sell them out the back door. And it's really difficult with spider web distribution to shut any of those down. Part of that's our own clients causing that problem. And the fact that we no longer make many of those technologies here in this country. How do, you, uh, how do you deal with that? Because I've had to deal with it several clients. And it's quite shocking if you haven't gone out and tried to buy some of those things. Yeah. Things that are ITAR violated in the US, I can't send to Canada, but I can have shipped to my house here. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, you know, it's amazing what the internet has done for infringers. Um, we have all kinds of different types of infringers now, but they all use the internet. You have the copyists, you have the counterfeiters, you have the competitor. Um, you have the, the stuff going out the back door that Keith just talked about. Um, this is something I've been involved in and our teams have are been involved in a lot over the last couple of years, um, is the problem that you can go after these, these distribution sources but you can't collect any money from them. And they just, it's, they just come back in another form. And oftentimes, when you start to peel the onion, you discover several, lay, several corporate layers back. You're dealing uh, with some, somebody in the Chinese government or something. And of course, then there's the trade wars that are going on and the, the enhancement of the Chinese intellectual property system that's going on. So this is a very dynamic problem. The biggest, the biggest problem right now that we're seeing is <clears throat> you can't collect, uh, you can't get the money that these people are making uh, from these sales. So you may be able to get Amazon or Alibaba to, to shut this site down, but the big trick is how to get the money that they've made from these sales. And Keith, you're right. It's, it's a huge, huge wound in the intellectual property body of, of the world. And it's not just hitting US companies, it's hitting companies around the world. And I think that uh, this shows what Professor Murgis talked about, which is it's not just patents, it's, cop it's, it's trademarks, um, it's design protection, uh, various design regimes around the world. All of these intellectual property rights have to be marshaled, uh, but these websites uh, these big, big websites are part of the problem. They, they're just allowing for this infringement to be rampant. George, go ahead. Rob, can I just ask, are, are you aware of the UK law proceeds of the crime? 
uh, and would that would that help uh, in this effort? That's one thing that the UK government has in its law that we've relied on very significantly in the copyright sector to help as both as a deterrent, but also to do the thing that I think you're describing, the thing that you're uh, describing as well as how do you recoup uh, the, the value uh, that's generated from this, this illegal behavior? Well, I, I, frankly, I need to talk to you more about this, but it's my understanding that you can get, you can, you can get a, um, you know, you can get a judgment in China, but you can't, the Chinese government will not allow the money uh, to come out of China. And uh, so, you know, Hong Kong was something we were looking at very carefully over the last two years as a way to seize these, these monies as they go from, uh, go through Hong Kong on their way to China. But of course, we all know what's going on in Hong Kong right now. So I'd love to talk to you more about this, George. But I'm telling you, this is, this is a very big issue. Because you can, you can make a bloody fortune, to use the British terminology. <laughs> you can make a bloody fortune by infringing on the internet now. I mean, it's probably a better business model to steal the really good products than it is to come up with them themselves, yourself. Let's do uh, one more. I think we have. One right here in the front. Uh, my name is John Fraser. I've spent my entire career commercializing intellectual property generated on universities. And I, I want to make two comments. One, uh, what we've been talking about, about the Chinese and, and infringement, uh, we did that to ourselves. Uh, Ten years ago, one of the founders of Intel wrote in uh, Bloomsburg's uh, paper that by outsourcing manufacturing to China, we were mortgaging our future. It's coming back to bite us. I think there are two things to be done. A, as Rob points out, bring back injunctions uh, so that we can really stop this. And secondly, outcompete, continue to innovate faster than the rest of the world. The second thing I want to say is uh, simply comment that there are universities are major players in terms of generating intellectual property, okay? Of the 150 billion spent by the feds, 70 billion is spent on campuses. Did you know that 20% of all FDA approved drugs were drugs founded, discovered on university campuses or at the NIH over the last 20 years? Universities created the biotech industry with in, uh, inventions that were commercialized. Look at search, Google out of Stanford. And at the end of the day, we just need to outcompete because I now consult internationally, Southeast Asia, South America, and they're out there studying what we have done. And they are not going to repeat our mistakes. So we just need to put in place the legal aspects that we had that worked, hammer home the fact that if you try and rip off from us, we're out to get you. But that's too defensive. We have to get down to the fact that we need to, frankly, encourage girls in grade four to look at STEM as careers to bring that half of our population to bear on this activity and outcompete everybody. Thank you for the comments. Um, I, I'm sure there are more questions, but in an effort to try to keep the trains moving on time, I'm, I'm going to conclude here. I, please join me in thanking my panelists.